Um, I'm so honored that you're here today, Bob. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm going to try to walk through this as quickly as possible and open it for questions. And I realize we have a limited amount of time. So <clears throat> I want you to take a step back. You've heard a lot about the industry. So this is coming at our industry discussion from a slightly different place. Let's take a step back for a second. Try to imagine a world in which every person, every place, and everything has a real-time transparent rating that you can look up. Imagine if every person, place, and thing had a tracker, basically. Everybody that interacts with you rates you. Everybody that interacts with the product rates it. Everyone that visits a place rates it. Okay, now think about what that might do to the market research industry or whatever we're gonna call it in the next 10 years. And that's what I'm talking uh, about today. It's pretty disruptive. So, let's get this big. Now, what I'd like to do, speaking of disruption, is I'd actually like to ask you to do something that most speakers don't want you to do, which is turn your cell phones on, your mobile phones on. You could follow along on Twitter. Uh, my handle's at Robert P. Moran. And um, I've actually uploaded the slides so you can take a look at the slides as we go and push them around. Um, okay, so I'm talking to you today about ratocracy. Now, the fact is, uh, this is not, at this point now, a new topic. It's actually sort of been hashed out quite a bit. Um, I've specifically written about it in three venues, in the Futurist magazine, uh, in Research World, uh, and also in Sodexo's big annual workplace trends report. Um, and you can read about it in any of these three. I take somewhat different takes on it and explore it in different ways. Um, and this is an interesting point and shows a little bit where the market research industry is going overall. I started out my career as a pollster, a uh, political pollster, went into market research or whatever we're gonna call it in the future. Uh, but I'm also a futurist. And so today, most of my presentation is speaking to you as a futurist and looking at some of the ways that our business will be disrupted by this. So what is ratocracy? I'm not the best person at naming a trend. This is my best, my best attempt. But ratocracy is real-time, numeric, transparent ratings for people, places, and things. You could already, in fact, start to see a little bit of this uh, in your own lives. So if you've flown in um, to, to the airport in Singapore, you'll see that they ask you in real time to rate uh, the immigration control officer that you just interacted with. This is just one minor example. Now, the fascinating thing about this is it's where many trends intersect, right? So we have social and the rise of social, which we all know about, right? We have the location-based data, which is only made possible by all the satellite telemetry, and that locks in the, the social space, the local space. And then we have mobile phones. Now, we won't always have a mobile phone. If you talk to, um, if you talk to folks at sort of the MIT Media Lab, et cetera, they'll say that uh, the progress of computing technology was a computer being a thing in a building that the military owned to a thing in a building that a corporation owned to a thing in a room in a building that a corporation owned to a thing that a corporation owned to a thing that you get to own but you have in a room to a thing that you get to own and is you get to carry around called a laptop to a thing that you get to own and carry around in your pocket called a phone and you just keep going, right? So eventually, we end up merging with our computing technology. And who knows if it looks like Google, you know, the sort of Google Glass, or it looks like something else. But my money is on some kind of heads-up display. And what that means is all of your visual field becomes enriched by all this additional information um, and ratings of everything you see around you. Uh, you know, we'll be able to estimate people's credit scores. And so you can scan a room for people with the best credit score that you want to talk to. Um, and that, that will happen, um, interestingly enough. Now, 
it's important if we paint this future to actually talk about where we are today and how this is going to develop. So um, I created this schema so you can sort of find yourself today and see what I'm talking about in the future. So if you think about uh, the world that we inhabit today in terms of information and where ratocracy is going, the, there's a, one axis, the vertical axis, is from periodic to continuous information flows, right? And most of you started out selling periodic information flows, and now you're in a continuous information flow world, right? And that's just a challenge that we all have. And then there's, then there's the uh, horizontal axis going from proprietary data information to open source. Okay, now when you cross those, what do you get? In the lower left-hand corner, you get something that you all are very familiar with, customer satisfaction research. It's proprietary and it's periodic. It takes too long, you know, people are trying to cut it back, you know, it's the trackers, right? Okay, so that's customer satisfaction research. That's a lot of what market research does today. Okay, uh, now, if it's open source information and it's periodic, that's kind of like the consumer reports kind of data that NGOs and stuff put out, okay? Right, you're all very familiar with that. If it's continuous information and it's proprietary, that's all the information that you're getting from CRM, CEM software systems um, today. And so we're familiar with that. It's this upper right hand corner of the chart that's, that's kind of interesting though. Uh, and that's what we call ratocracy. So right now, you see the beginnings of that niche by niche with Rate My Teachers, Angie's List, Glassdoor.com, eBay, Yelp, et cetera. It's fascinating to me how many CEOs do not actually know about Glassdoor and are kind of stunned when we show them Glassdoor um, and they see their own rating as a CEO on Glassdoor. It's kind of fun to watch. Um, but what we're going to talk about is just in that upper right-hand corner today. And we're well on our way. Um, and you could, so you can see how this trend is developing. So for products and services, you've got Yelp, Angie's List, eBay Feedback, Rotten Tomatoes, TripAdvisor, and on and on and on. For employers, Glassdoor is the big one right now. For educators, this thing's blown up because you have a lot of Gen Y using mobile tools to rate their professors, rate their teachers, you can see that. And it, they're, 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 these are popping up so much, I quit trying to categorize them all. Uh, if I ever write a book on it, I will, but it's, it's just there's so many of them, you can only lock down a, a couple. Now, the big question is, how do you create a universal rating app for everything, right? Now, so, you know, it could be that you use a social network like Facebook and you build that on top of it, and then you use that as your rating platform. But how do you create some kind of a numeric system to rate everyone and everything in some kind of way? Is it trust? Is it reliability? What is it? Is it a rolled score? Not easy. Um, and I've talked to a number of different companies that have tried this. Right now, we haven't had any successes. I mean, we had a lot of attempts, and those are successes in that they've proven where we can't go, but we haven't had an example yet of a success where we can go. So uh, some firms have tried, as I said. Um, Honestly.com attempted to turn truth, to create truth and reputation, but it failed. <laughs> uh, which is not bad, you know, in Silicon Valley speak, that's not bad, we're just attempting new things. Um, and so, uh, hold on a second. Um, and so there are a number of firms that have tried. Um, uh, one uh, that I've talked to in uh, Silicon Valley was SWIP, and I don't know where they're at today. But a number of firms have tried it. In fact, it's funny, when I, I chatted with the folks at Institute for the Future in Palo Alto a couple years ago, and I ran this idea by them, and they looked at me and said, oh, that's so funny. We just had people come in last week with this idea. So the fact is, you know, Innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. What ha a number of people start thinking about an idea and testing it and trying it. Um, and there are a lot of smart people trying to figure out how to do this. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to paint some future scenarios to kind of just give you a little taste of what this, what ratocracy might actually look and feel like uh, in the futures. Now, 
The reason why I, I like to talk about future scenarios is the future is actually open and plural. It's not singular. So futurists hate when people say future because there isn't one future. There's many futures, but you get it. So I'm just painting one future. I'll paint another one here in a minute. So this is one future. So imagine that you get on a plane and you fly to Las Vegas and you check in and you notice well, and you check in, and you got a regular room, and you're really excited. You're ready to hit the pool and then hit, hit the tables tonight. But you see the receptionist taking a little longer on a, on a computer next to her, and then you get a much better room. But you don't know why. Well, you explain this later to a friend at the pool, at the casino, and they say, oh, no. She was checking your cloud score, and your cloud score was above a certain threshold, and so she gave you a much better room because she knows you're, you're going to tweet about it. You know, she knows you're a social network influencer, right? Now, keep going in time. Oh, the receptionist just checked your universal rating score, or whatever you want to call it, woofy. I mean, people have called it woofy, et cetera. She, she, they checked it. They said, wow, you have a lot of reputational currency. We're going to give you, you know, a room with, you know, two bathrooms and a view of the strip and da, da 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 right? Okay, well, that's pretty cool, right? That's an interesting scenario, except it's not a future scenario. This already happened. This already happened a couple years ago. Um, and you can actually uh, look it up and Google it, and there's a whole story about how casinos are actually checking your, Twitter uh, your number of Twitter followers and your clout score and giving you better rooms today based on that interesting future scenario that's actually already in the rear view mirror. Now let's take another future scenario that could be fun. So imagine that you have a contracting business. You're a home contractor. You have a contracting business. And, what, and you have a difficult, difficult uh, home renovation client. And when she's done with you, she ends up just blowing you up on a rating and really deep sixing your uh, reputation score. Well, this is a big problem for you, right? Because now everybody can read about this reputation score. It hurts your overall reputation score as a firm, and that does your company real damage. What do you do? Well, you, you're in America, so of course you, you sue her. Um, well, actually, that's actually not of future scenario either. That's history. Um, in fact, that happened way back in 2012. Um, it's one of the first, it was a, it's a precedent setting case because it's a lawsuit for a negative online rating. You're gonna see a ton of these in the future. If courts hold that reputation is a tangible thing and you've unfairly damaged someone's property, their reputation, if, pro if reputation is property and someone damages your property, then they are liable for unfairly damaging your property. Make sense? So it's going to be a fascinating, I mean, it could be a boon for, you know, for the trial lawyers, um, but it, it's going to be fascinating to watch. And this just shows how quickly the legal system is starting to catch up with ratocracy. Now, the funny thing is, science fiction writers have been all over this for a long time. Let's involve the audience. Um, has, has anyone out there read Super Sad True Love Story? It's going to become a movie. <laughs> Super Sad True Love Story? No? Okay. All right. Well, it's going to be a great movie. It's a lot of fun. It's about the end of the United States. The U.S. implodes. And, and it's about a lot of interesting future technologies. And it's about this love story gone horribly wrong. And, and I think it's got Ben Stiller uh, is going to play the, uh, the part of Lenny, uh, the main character, who's sort of a mensch. But, um, so that's, uh, that's by Gary Steingart. Has anyone read Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom? Strongly recommend that book. No? Okay. Probably won't be a movie. A little, probably a little too blue for for the big screen, but um, that's by Cory Doctor, a famous technologist and science fiction writer. Both of these books, written hmm, five, six years ago, three, four years ago in the case of Super Sad True Love Story, both of these books actually anticipated ratocracy and reputation as a hard asset that individuals and corporations use. In fact, if you're interested in exploring this a little bit more in a fun way, read Down and Out, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom because they explore that as an entirely separate alternative economic system. 
So there are a bunch of implications then for corporations when we think about ratocracy. First of all, that's gonna, it's gonna change the balance of power. Um, it's going to make things more democratic than ever because the crowd is now rating you and watching you. You're already seeing this, in, for example, in a, interestingly enough, in China. In China, they have something people, it translates weirdly into English, it's called the human flesh search engine. What they mean is, is that people all around Chinese leaders are watching them and then reporting on their unethical behavior. So if you just search human flesh search engine China, you'll see, you'll see all about it. It's an attempt by the people of China to hold their leaders to account. Uh, and you're going to see a lot more of that when you get ratocracy. It's also going to increase customer expectations. Hey, I just rated you on something, I expect you to at least change it, right? Um, it makes corporate leadership very different because you get real-time feedback on everything you do right and everything you do wrong. It means then for a brand that you have to manage the reputation of the brand 24-7. Uh, you know, and you have to then have community managers handling issues constantly. It gives you a very tight feedback loop, so tight that it might actually displace a lot of what we do today well, that is feedback loop related. Or we might end up becoming data miners of this information flow of these rating, of these scores, of these rating scores. Employees are then clearly going to be used as uh, leading indicators. We're going to have challenges with whether this stuff is statistically you know, projectable or not. It probably won't be in the near term, but eventually will. Um, and then we'll have to just figure out how we're going to use this, all these information trends in order to make much faster decisions. Now, there are three paths to ratocracy, and they're worth watching. They're also important because you all might want to start a company that tries to play out in one of these places. One is niche by niche. So just take a niche, any niche, and create a ratings company based on that. Make it public, put it on a mobile phone, go for it and see if you can get funding, right? That's what's happening right now. So niche by niche is what's going on first. The next is middleware, where somebody tries to knit together all of these niche by niche systems into some sort of centralized app or place. And then the final, the big one, the holy grail, would be some kind of a universal rating platform. Um, and I wrote quite a bit about how this might develop uh, in uh, Research World magazine. Now, a lot more to get into, probably not in depth today, but there are a number of developments depending on what we're talking about, on whether it's products, where I think you're gonna begin with consumer durables, whether it's services, where I think the ratings will be sort of at the brand level of the service, whether it's service providers or service locations, people or places. The service locations is interesting because it's a fixed geographic space, so you can rate that, and, a and there's a place that then can be rated. So if you think about it, if you're in the QSR business or a hospital or a hotel lodging, all those are fixed assets in a, in a, in a, a, a single location or num numerous locations, and you could rate that location. Uh, over time, and you could then get a rating and say, ooh, don't want to go to that QSR, has a bad sort of a lower score, you know, or ooh, that hospital, huh, not sure I'd like to go there. So you can actually see, because it's physically uh, located, you could get those scores. Now there have been, as I mentioned, a number of attempts at a universal rating platform. There was Oink back in 2011. Uh, that got started by Milk Labs, but it only lasted about five months. Then there was Stamped, which started, was started by Googlers, which was an attempt to say you stamp this object as a stamp of approval. Then there was SWIP, which tried more of like a basic rating scale like you'd see in Singapore's airport. And they're all, you know, they're all sort of still trying to figure out where to go and how to play. But it's, this is a space worth watching. Now inevitably, what you're going to have is it won't be a phone, it'll be some kind of heads up display, some glasses or contact lenses or something like this. And you'll be able to scan a room, walk down the street, and you'll be able to see the people on it and the ratings of the people. You'll be able to see the ratings of the stores and the restaurants, everything. Um, there's a joke in Washington that this will be like the perfect sort of way to work a room. Uh, because you'll just be able to scan the room and see who has the most power, and then you could just go talk to them and leave everybody else out. Um, 
And there are actually people working on an app that would do that. That's the great part. Um, and so uh, part of the future then is simply just all of this information then converging on the visual, on some kind of an inner visual interface uh, for the consumer. So with that, I see that I have 13 seconds left. I did exactly my 20 minutes. Um, but if you're interested uh, and have any Definitely questions, question. feel free to ping me, uh, or you could just Google some of those articles and. and We're going to give uh, you one, one question look. if anybody okay. has a question. One okay, one question. <laughs> Even with those two seconds left. Yep, we've got Andrew up here. Yes. The mic. Who's? Andrew's right here. Hi, great talk. Um, I think the one key thing for me is this whole thing about being sued for the negative reviews, because yeah. then doesn't this destroy it because people either don't react or give a positive reaction? I mean, I was in a hotel somewhere and they were almost trying to force me to, you know, give them a positive review on TripAdvisor. Don't you see that as the biggest yeah. risk? Well, it's an interesting issue. So um, the first case that I'm aware of was uh, in Virginia. And, you know, like anything else, the case law, because we have a common law system, English-speaking countries have a common law system, the law will just evolve with us. So it'll be fascinating to see that case law evolve. And who knows? I mean, it is interesting because French continental law could just have go one way, uh, but English common law evolves. And so, you know, if you think about how common law has evolved with the rise of capitalism or mark uh, or uh, industrialism, et cetera, I mean, we sort of redesigned law based on what was uh, how the society developed. Um, but I do think it's a fascinating issue of do only the, the haters rate you? Do only the lovers rate you? Do people feel like they have to self-censor you? How exactly does that work? You know, when you talk to folks though on the technology side, they say, well, if you, but if you end up getting millions of ratings or thousands of ratings, you know, on a person, if you take the ratings data with the price of their house, with their driving record, you know, with their with what we can impute to their writing credit score, you know, with whether they've ever been uh, convicted of a of a misdemeanor, et cetera, et cetera, we could start to create a much higher, much more much more robust individual rating system. So I could scan the room and I could see people who I probably you know might not want to talk to or hang out with, and people that you know might be uh, sort of. Uh, folks that I, you know you'd want to do business with, and I think that's what's going to happen. People won't like it at first, but people uh, originally keep in mind people were originally against cameras. So everybody thinks a new technology is scary, but people were originally against cameras. There were a, a number of articles in newspapers that were very anti-camera because they said people's privacy will be invaded. And you can compare the uh, writing about cameras to the writing about drones today to see just how people. Uh, react to new technologies. And this is just another new technology, and people will get used to being in the fishbowl. Soul stealers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Bob. you. Thank you.